So uh, we're going to meditate a little bit on that passage you heard read from 1 John chapter 1, where John gives us a command to walk in the light. Walk in the light. What is it to walk in the light? I want to be begin to respond to that question by actually reading a section of Timothy Ware's account of his own conversion to Christian orthodoxy at the age of 17. Timothy Ware, who would eventually go by the name Callistos Ware, um, would go on to become one of the most prominent <clears throat> and recognized Eastern Orthodox theologians of our time, Oxford University professor and writer. Uh, he passed from us about two years ago. As it happens, actually, in my 20s, I uh, was a part of the C.S. Lewis Foundation, and we'd have these conferences in Oxford and Cambridge a week in each place every three years, and I was responsible for coordinating the breakout speakers at those conferences, which actually uh, meant that I was also a driver uh, to pick these speakers up, kind of an Uber before Uber, and uh, I would go pick these speakers up from the airports or from other cities, and uh, one day I had to go pick up Bishop Callistos Ware from Oxford, where he lived and taught, and drive him over to Cambridge to speak. Um, I'm 20-something, and um, I wish I knew who I had in the car for those two and a half hours. I mean, it was a really a missed opportunity. I had not read his stuff, and, and even his person was somewhat unfamiliar to me. He had the long black Orthodox robe and the heavy silver cross hanging from his chest and the long Orthodox beard. And, he was pretty quiet, uh, but man, if I knew now what I, if I knew then what I know now, I had, would have a lot of questions. I would have learned a lot. So uh, at least I got a chance to meet him, and I really revere his life and work. But Timothy Ware was young once too. And at 17, he recounts he was walking through London on a particular day when something extraordinary happened. Quote, it happened quite unexpectedly one Saturday afternoon in the summer of 1952. When I was 17, I was walking along the Buckingham Palace Road, close to Victoria Station in central London, when I passed the 19th century Gothic church, large and somewhat dilapidated in that neighborhood. I'd never noticed it before. There was no proper notice board outside of it. Public relations have never been a strong suit for the orthodoxy in Western world. But I recall there was a brass plate which simply said Russian Church as I entered St. Philip's, for that's what it was called. At first, I thought the church was entirely empty. Outside in the street, there had been brilliant sunshine. But inside, it was cool, cavernous, and dark. As my eyes grew accustomed to the gloom, the first thing that caught my attention was an absence. There were no pews no chairs. In front of me stretched a wide and vacant expanse of polished floor. Then I realized that the church was not altogether empty. Scattered in the nave and aisles were a few worshipers, most of them elderly. Along the walls there were icons with flickering lamps in front of them, and at the east end there were burning candles in front of the icon screen. Somewhere out of sight, a choir was singing. My initial impression of an absence was now replaced with a sudden rush by an overwhelming sense of presence. I felt that the church, so far from being empty, was full, full of countless unseen worshipers surrounding me on every side. Intuitively, I realized that we, the visible congregation, were part of a much larger whole and that as we prayed, we were being taken up into an action far greater than ourselves, into an undivided history. That time changed my life forever. End quote. Certainly what Timothy Ware sensed was indeed the presence of God, but also the presence of other worshipers, both present and past. And if you've ever been to an Orthodox church, there are going to be hundreds of icons 
uh, picturing and representing um, Christians from the past. And I think we too, uh, as Christians in the 21st century, can appreciate this history that we sit here perched uh, on the edge of millions of those who have come before, great number of witnesses who have handed down the faith to us. Anglicans in particular, of course, um, recognize that we have received in our tradition what has been passed on to us from the 16th century English Reformation, but not just that, from the early church and from Christ himself. Queen Elizabeth I, who kind of led the establishment of the Anglican Reformation in England, wrote in a letter to Emperor Ferdinand, reassuring the Catholic ruler on the continent, that Anglicanism, quote, followed no novel and strange religion, but that very religion which is ordained by Christ, sanctioned by the early church fathers, and approved by the collective mind and voice of the early church, end quote. Indeed, Elizabeth commissioned scholars to help her ground the Anglican faith in the pre-Anglican history, beginning with Christ, of course, and on through the church fathers and mothers and the early church. I begin with all this because there is a we-ness to the Christian faith, to the first disciples and to Christ himself. We not only have an historical kinship going back a few thousand years, but we have a kinship now with all the Christians in the world. So many of them worshiping in faraway places like Africa, India, South America, where you could walk into an Anglican church in any of those countries, and if you had a proper translation, it would feel all very familiar as the service went on. This historical and Contemporary fellowship is at the heart of John's message in this first chapter of his letter and has much to do with what it means to walk in the light. Here again is how he begins. That which was from the beginning, which we have heard, which we have seen with our eyes, which we have looked at and our hands have touched, this we proclaim concerning the world of life. The life appeared, we've seen it and testify to it, and we proclaim to you the eternal life which was with the Father and has appeared to us. We proclaim to you what we have seen and heard, so that you also may have fellowship with us. And our fellowship is with the Father and his Son, Jesus Christ. We write this to make our joy complete. This letter was probably written about 60 to 70 years after Jesus' resurrection to churches in Ephesus, which is modern-day Turkey. And in it, John begins by pointing back. That which was from the beginning, referring to Christ, of course, and the new covenant. He says, we, those first disciples, heard it. We saw it with our eyes. We looked at it. And our hands have actually touched the risen Jesus himself. Last week, Reverend Jin walked us through the presentation of Jesus' body with its scars to the disciples, inviting them to touch him, although uh, none of them took him up on it. It was enough to see him there before them. The week before, we talked about on Easter that bodies matter to God, and we are meant to have bodies eternally in the new earth. And here the writer says, literally, we have touched Jesus, and we are now with those same hands literally passing this down to you. We are handing it down. The Greek word is paradosis, the tradition. And what is it that it passed down? Well, in this passage, we see the words. Life, the word of life. Passing down light. Passing down fellowship. Passing down joy. The words kind of tumble forth from John's first four verses like a waterfall. There's a lot of energy you can feel in this first opening, which actually is, in spite of the English translation, one long sentence. John is energized. And you'll notice these images of life and light and joy and fellowship are expansive images. Light expands out. Life grows out. 
Fellowship gathers in what is out, and joy, of course, is contagious. And indeed, this is what John is inviting his listeners to, this we-ness that has been passed down, this expansiveness of the faith to all people who would receive it. This tone and what else we get in this first letter has led commentators to suggest that something was going on in this community, some fracturing, something that was drawing them away such that John is urging them to remain in the fellowship for the sake of their own joy. And it's likely that what was happening was some early form of something called Gnosticism that was infiltrating the community and leading to succession. Now, Gnosticism took many forms in the ancient world, and it's really hard to define it precisely because of the number of forms it took. Um, But we can say a few things about it. One is that Gnosis, of course, means knowledge. And the Gnostics were called Gnostics because they claimed a secret knowledge of God, something only they knew, something only they could have access to, something that made them special and resulted in in a kind of elitism among such a group. That kind of claim to secret knowledge, um, that's seductive now even, isn't it? I think think we all want to be part of an in-group, those people who really know what's going on, elevating and distinguishing ourselves from others. This is the appeal, of course, of gossip. It's we who really know what's going on. It's probably also the appeal of conspiracy theories, which gather large followings as a part of a group of insiders. We see what no one else sees. Even the so-called philosophers, the masters of suspicion, Freud, Marx, and Nietzsche, for all their brilliant insights, were of this same ilk, bent on exposing what was really going on in Christianity sex, or power, or class. The ego loves secret knowledge. That which takes us away from what is for all people and towards that which is only for a few. Away from fellowship and into division, into secrecy, into a certain darkness. But such a movement runs exactly counter to the expansive nature of the gospel of Jesus Christ. That it is for all, that it is in the light, that it is filled with light and invites fellowship among all. And so John in these opening verses and the rest of this chapter and the rest of the letter is urging them to come back into the light, back into fellowship. That which has been seen and obviously known from the beginning. The second feature of Gnosticism, besides secret knowledge, was the belief that only knowledge mattered. That one could pretty much ignore this world or even one's behavior in it. Gnosticism was otherworldly. And even what one did with their body didn't matter because that was going to pass away in Gnosticism. It was the soul and the mind that only mattered. And I think we even see a version of this Gnosticism again in contemporary culture. Those who may be tempted to think that only their brilliance or their achievements or their talents are what matter and what they do in their private lives, in their darkness, um, can stay in the dark, which of course it never does. (laughs) That is a form of contemporary Gnosticism. The splitting off of the self from itself. And so John urges them all, bring your whole life into the light with others. And he sees this light kind of in two concentric circles in this chapter. He says plainly first, our fellowship is with the Father and with his Son. And later on in chapter 3, he'll speak of the Spirit as well. And he says, that circle is light. God is light. Now light... Boy, that's the most expansive symbol in Scripture. It connotes so many things. It brings order, as in, God said, let there be light. (laughs) There was light, there was day, and there was night. It brings order, it brings safety. 
It brings wisdom. It brings understanding. And it brings life. Light is also the symbol throughout the scriptures for God's presence. Think of the fire that led the Israelites through the wilderness or of Jesus himself. Incarnate, Emmanuel, the light of the world. To walk in the light then is to walk in the presence of God. The Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit, that first concentric circle is to walk in fellowship with God is to walk in the light. This is the first and foundational we-ness. Are we alone in the universe, people wonder? No. <laughs> Although perhaps not in the way they suspect. God created the world, indeed, for the sake of fellowship. So the Trinity could share their love with us. That is the foundational we-ness. Rowan Williams writes, God has called us into being because he wants our company and will redeem us for the same reason. The external, the eternal desire for our company. It's not a divine need that we are summoned into existence to satisfy for him, but an overflowing divine generosity that seeks to share itself more and more, even with those that are other, which we certainly are, to God. We are different, created to be different. But that is no boundary to his desire to share his love with us. To walk in the light is to walk simply in company with God and friendship with Jesus. I think we often think of friendship as kind of Private, kind of face-to-face, taking place in private spaces or places set apart, as if Jesus going off into the wilderness to be with his Father. And that certainly is part of friendship. These kind of cloistered moments with friends, that intimacy. But relationship, but friendship can also be, as C.S. Lewis defines it, not just face-to-face, but side-by-side looking out together. Walking and looking out at the same things, with the same joys, the same sense of humor, the same values. Often sharing a vision of what lies before us. I think it's why so many of our friendships often came, if you think about them, from when we were working or playing with others toward a common vision. Friends look out and they see the same things illuminated. Lewis famously wrote, I believe in Christianity as I believe that the sun has risen, not only because I see it, but because by it I see everything else. To walk in the light is to walk side by side in friendship with God and with Jesus, looking out on the world, seeing it with his light. I'll say that again. To walk in the light is to walk in friendship with God, looking out on the world with him, seeing it all by his light. That is the foundational circle of fellowship. That is the center of walking in the light. But of course, the most important thing we see as we're walking side by side with God each day are other people. To see others with God's light upon them is to see them as people wanted by God. This is no secret knowledge. This is not reserved for the elite. It has been clear from the beginning, Christ came into the world for all people. This is is the light, by the way, that created the world. The first thing created in Genesis and now seeks to gather it all back into himself. And we as God's friends, as Jesus' friends, look upon this same world with longing, seeking its return and shalom to its Father. And this longing to share this light with others, to be in fellowship with us, is the second concentric circle of fellowship in this chapter. The friendship with those that we have discovered 
have discovered themselves their life with the Father. John's going to oppose this to walking in the darkness. And here he comes to talk about sin. He says, if we claim to have fellowship with God and yet walk in the darkness, we lie and don't live out the truth. And then a little further down, if we claim to be without sin, we deceive ourselves and the truth is not in us. John says the thing about walking in darkness is not only do we not see things with God's light, but there's a self-deception that happens. We not only do not see as God sees, but we can't even see ourselves. And this has implications for others. We walk in darkness, we collide with others. We injure others. It's like driving at night with the lights off. To walk on the light, on the other hand, is actually to walk with a kind of transparency. To let God's light make us visible as well. To be open to the truth about ourselves. It is to say we have nothing to hide, which doesn't mean there is no darkness in us. John says, um, when we sin, we have an advocate. And we get to transform or be transformed by God's transforming light. John takes for granted that we will sometimes wander into darkness. But he says, if anybody does sin, we have an advocate with the Father, Jesus Christ, the righteous one. And so we get to live transparently before God. We get to let his light x-ray us to find where we are walking or have wandered into darkness. As I've said many times in our weekly confession of sin that we will return to today, all we're really doing is laying ourselves transparently before God. As I often say, there is no condemnation. There's just good information like an x-ray. Oh, look at that. Look at that, Lord. Ah, but we live in transparency, not in hiddenness, not in darkness. We're not afraid of the truth. Christians should be the most transparent and open people people come across. A non-defensiveness, a recognition of our failures, our faults, our sins. We don't have to run and hide We have an advocate in Jesus. And so we can live with the truth of ourselves and let it be transformed. We are callable people. We can let God call us back into the light at any moment. We can let the commands call us by the Spirit, like the dashboard lights in our car that go on and say, needs maintenance. Oh, good to know. Good to know. And we do this We live transparently because we want to walk in fellowship, which John says in the last two words, four words, makes our joy complete. Is this not the case? That we want to be together in union with God, in union with others. Is this not the case that this is where joy comes from? And it's opposite, hiddenness, separation, isolation, darkness is where grief and despair and depression come from. In the light lies joy. There's perhaps no better summary of all this outside of 1 John than that which we hear in 2 Corinthians 4, 6, where Paul writes, For God who said, let light shine out of darkness in that first creation. God who said, with that first light, Let it shine out of darkness. May that same light shine in our hearts to give us the knowledge of God's glory displayed in the face of Christ. There is the concentric circle of fellowship with God. That that light lets us see the face of Christ looking at us in fellowship. God desires our company He desires our friendship. My friend who used to work um, as an assistant to the evangelical theologian, Anglican, I will add, Anglican evangelical theologian, John Stott. He worked for him for about a year. He was living in London. I was living in Dublin. I would get to come over and hang out with him. 
John told Ken, my friend, John Stott told Ken, that he wakes up in the morning, every morning, swings his legs out of bed and says, good morning, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Good morning, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. And he would begin his day, Stott would, walking in the light, walking in friendship with God through all of the day's events and encounters. I had to ask myself this week, am I a friend of Jesus? It wasn't an accusatory question. I think the answer is yes. But do I enjoy this friendship? Do I move with a sense of this friendship, of Jesus and I and and my brothers and sisters looking out together on the world? Indeed, it's even closer than that, isn't it? It's not even as far as someone next to me. It is someone in me whose eyes I am looking out on as he looks out on it. Paul will say, it is no longer I who live, but Christ lives in me. We might say, it is no longer I who see, but Christ sees in me. What is walking in the light? It is practicing the friendship of Jesus. Looking out on the world with the light of God. Not just vertically, but horizontally. Looking out on the world together. For in his light, says the psalmist, we see light. We see all things illumined by God as they are and as they should be. How he sees the world and longing that the world would have a relationship, what John calls fellowship, in this light. Longing for a we-ness with the Father. For there, John says, is the joy we long for. We pray these things in the name of that first concentric circle, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit.